Meet Dorian Sagan. He's a science writer, the son of Carl Sagan and Lynn Margulis, and he also describes himself as an eclectic dilettante because he writes science stories about almost all topics in science. Here he is with his mother, Lynn Margulis, and he has written all kinds of wonderful books. Here's Microcosmos, Four Billion Years of Microbial Evolution. Here's Acquiring Genomes, A Theory of the Origins of Species. He's also collaborated with his mother to write What is Life? What is Sex? And more specifically, The Origins of Sex. Now, most recently, he's written Into the Cool. I can recommend this if you're interested in far from equilibrium dissipative systems and how they're kind of alive. And also, most recently, a book with Josh Middeldorf about cracking the aging code, why we get old, why we have to die. I sat down with him at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, and we talked about the question, are we alone? My name is Dorian. Dorian Sagan. Sagan. Okay, and what do you do? Um, I'm an eclectic dilettante. An eclectic dilettante? I, oh, yeah. All right. And uh, now you have a rock there. Yes. And I've noticed that that's a dead thing and you're a, you're a life form, aren't you? I pass well for one usually. You pass for one usually. And is there any time you haven't passed for one? Mm, maybe when I was hiding in my bed trying to be... Yeah. No, I guess I usually... I don't know. I'm... I, um, wait, wait. Hamper. You wrote a book called What is Life? So you should know, right? Yeah, yeah, I should. Well, so tell us about what you what life is then. Well, and what is life? Um, it was a, it's sort of a poetic, philosophical, scientific meditation on what life is, which was treated by uh, Erwin Schrodinger, and um, before that, there's several books with that title now. But um, I think that was what was different about that book is it looked at the history of life and it embedded that into the definition and you know if you look at the etymology of definition it's to define it's to perform a limit around something and that becomes difficult with life because life as an evolutionary process is not only changing and evolving um, phylogenetically but it's also expanding physically and people like um, um, Vladimir Vernadsky pointed out that over the course of evolutionary history, more and more chemical elements become involved in the process of life at Earth's surface. So you have actual ex expansion, not only of materials in space, but of the actual elements involved in the process that we call alive. So it makes it difficult to come up with a very ironclad definition of life. So it was really a meditation on an expanding evolutionary definition of life and it looked at different definitions and it talked about both the history of life and the diversity of life. Now you, you traced the, uh, the evolution of life on this planet, you started talked about microbes and then eukaryotes. Now could you channel your mother Lynn Margulis and, and let me ask you this, you're Lynn now, do you think that those, those, that sequence of events that happened here, prokaryotes to eukaryotes, do you think that would happen somewhere else on other planets? Is that something that's so fundamental that we should expect it elsewhere? Um, Lynn. Oh, Lynn. You're Lynn now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, um, I think that I think that um, if we are, and she probably wouldn't use the word statistics, but. Um, if we look at it from like a probabilistic manner, we look at the number of life forms and the behaviors of life forms and get out of our sort of like anthropocentric, anthropomorphic frame of mind, we see that there's these open systems and that are there all life forms are these thermodynamic um, systems that are trading energy and matter with their surroundings and often genes in symbiosis. So I would say, if life evolves or if life is spread, like as they imagine in, um, um, what is it called, um, panspermia, that life didn't necessarily evolve on Earth, but as people like Francis Crick said, has come through volcanoes and other things to different planets and is actually cycling through the universe, well then I think that would be a very likely scenario that you would see microbes forming higher levels of organization uh, uh, through the, the natural process, especially if, if uh, bacteria, for example, are cosmically common. 
Question, are we alone? Are we alone? Are we alone? I don't know. If that, can I give a Boolean answer? You can give whatever answer you want. Yes, no, and yes and no. Okay, and what are the what in the question, so those Boolean answers are because you're choosing different meanings for the word we? Well, like, I want to I wanna invoke quantum undecidability rather than answer that question with, yeah, I mean, who, who, who is we? Who is I, we in your yeah, mind? Who I'll, is we? If I, I mean, from a mystical standpoint, I am, I'm an open system, and, and just as we, as my mother, to channel her again, would say that um, viruses are not alive because they need the metabolism of the cell to, be, to exist, that same argument can be used about cells and organisms on Earth, that they need the surface of the biosphere in order to exist. But then the biosphere needs the sun, as Vernovsky would argue, and, that what, and, and why he used the term uh, Earth solar system rather than solar system in its descriptions of life. And of course, that only exists in the context of the whole. So if we really can't reduce, you know, in this kind of point, point by point thinking, which you might associate with a particle versus the wave and quantum mechanics, um, who, who the I is and who the we is to a single point, and really the only way that you can do it is to embrace the all, which is why I mentioned mysticism before, then we would both be alone because there's only one, and it's an illusion to think otherwise, but a very convincing one. No, wait, well, one biosphere but but if there are other no, biospheres no one i mean there's one be there's one being every being that exists even on other planets even on other planets that would be my mystical answer, <coughs> that'd know? be your mystical one yeah, I'd only, but i don't but i'd only devote like up to about a hundred million depending on what was left over after the philosophers stopped partying to that question